It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. Another morning brings more news of more Ford government cuts to health care services the families rely on. Municipalities report that ambulance and paramedic services will see their funding frozen at 2017 levels, and the Ontario Telemedicine Network has eliminated 44 frontline staff jobs. Can the Premier confirm these latest health care cuts and explain why the government feels Ontario families can do without these services? Questions to the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. I have to tell you, I had a real interesting uh, visitor, Mr. Speaker, yesterday. It was a grade 11 student from Lindsay. And he couldn't, he couldn't figure out why the opposition couldn't figure out where all the spending went for the last 15 years that they doubled the debt, they increased the debt by 200 million. And this is a grade 11 student. He said to his friends, he said he'd go up to his friends and say, when you turn 18 and your parents give you a credit card and it's just accumulated debt and you're paying, and you're paying interest, you're paying interest, Order. and you're paying interest, do you want to continue racking up the debt or do you want to pay it off? And once he explained it that way, all his friends in grade 11 said, yeah, it makes sense, pay off the debt. My point is, Mr. Speaker, Response. the NDP doesn't understand it, but a grade 11 student gets it. It's all about spending, spending, spending that they put our province in debt. That's what it's all about. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Say, Speaker, that what the Premier doesn't get is the vast majority of hardworking families in this province don't give their kids a company or a credit card when they turn 18. <laughs> the cuts to telemedicine. The cuts to telemedicine are particularly irresponsible. Order. Speaker, the Ford government. Order. The Ford government had claimed that they intended to. Really? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order and allow the questions to be asked, so that I can hear them. Restart the clock. Leader of the opposition. The Ford government had claimed that they intended to boost the amount of virtual medical care in Ontario, but now they're hand handing layoff notices to 44 of the very people who provide that service. The Premier's promise that no government employee would lose their job is about as credible as his promise that parents of children with autism would never have to demonstrate on the lawns of Queen's Park again. Why is the Premier breaking his promise to protect health care jobs? Question to the Premier. The Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Well, in fact, the situation with the Ontario Telemedicine Network is this. They're making thoughtful, pragmatic decisions about how they're using taxpayer dollars, which is what Ontarians expect them to do and they expect us to do. With respect to the emergency department services, we are streamlining and modernizing the service by consolidating dispatch Order. and service delivery into regional locations and adopting new models of care to build a sustainable, connected system. This is all part of our overall plan to modernize our health care system, to make sure that patients receive the care that they need. They receive connected care throughout their journey in health care, which is not the situation that we have right now. We want to center care around patients, and that's what we're delivering on. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, their plan to uh, streamline and modernize is simply a, a cloak of cuts that this government's putting in place. People don't actually see a plan for health care, Speaker, uh, but the people who ensure that our ambulances arrive on time and our children are vaccinated, they don't see a plan either. All they see is cuts and chaos, cuts to public health units, cuts to ambulance services, cuts to telemedicine, cuts to OHIP coverage. If the Ford government truly has this plan, Speaker, why why do doctors, paramedics, nurses, Reeves, chairs, and mayors all tell us that the only plan they see is a plan to cut and hurt families? Minister to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Through you, I just want to correct the record of what the leader of the official opposition just said. We are actually adding more, over a billion dollars yeah. more into our health care system, and in our budget. We to do is 
protect what matters most, to make sure that we actually have a health care system and have an education system in the future, because we uh, as sustained and received a $15 billion deficit. That, that is a huge amount of debt. And what we are doing is building up the things that are most important, the things that people most care about. Health care is probably top on that list. And I can tell the leader of the official opposition that health care providers are very, very enthusiastic about the changes that we're bringing about. Yep. We are receiving Order. numerous applications already Bonds. for local health service providers. So to suggest that people are not happy is entirely wrong. People are very happy that we're making the changes that we're making and can't wait to get started. Yep. <laughs> the next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but here's a newsflash for the Minister. Nobody believes that all of these people have one opinion and the government has another opinion and the government's might right and everybody else is wrong, Speaker. Everybody can see through what this government is claiming. Order. Yesterday, in fact, municipalities also received some shocking fallout from the Ford government's big budget cuts. Support for regional tourism is ending effective this year, blasting yet another multi-million dollar hole in municipal budgets. Can the Premier tell us how much his province's download will cost municipality and property taxpayers? Question to the Premier. For, for you, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to repeat what the Minister of Health just uh, mentioned. Has the Leader of the Opposition ever added up everything that she's promised? We're in a $15 billion hole. All the people, Mr. Speaker, all the people up in the stands there, everywhere else, they're $23,000 in debt. We have the largest sub-sovereign sub debt in the entire world created by the NDP and the Liberals. It's unsustainable. I wonder if they run their family budgets the same way they would run the public's budget, because they don't care. It's not their money. Our government's worried about the people's money. We worry about what, what is most important, which is health care, which we increased $1.3 billion. They worry about education. That we increased seven hundred million dollars. No teachers are going to lose their jobs. Seniors are going to get dental care that they've been waiting for for years. That's what matters to people. Not about spend, spend, spend. Tax, tax. Thank, thank you. Supplementary question. S Speaker, the City of Toronto estimates the Premier's download is draining $100 million out of city budgets this year alone, and London has been forced to contemplate a property tax hike to backfill the Premier's cuts. The Ford government budget is forcing municipalities to choose between property tax hikes, cuts to services, or both. When the Premier ran last year, he didn't tell people that he'd be Ontario's first tax and cut premier. Why is the premier raising taxes and cutting services? Questions to the premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Refer to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. And, uh, I want to thank uh, the premier for referring the question to me. We were crystal clear at uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario conference, the Roma conference, the Osom conference, the Noma conference. You know, Speaker, we inherited a 15 billion dollar deficit from the Liberal Party, supported 97 percent of the time by the NDP. We made it very clear that we were going to do a line-by-line -line review of our expenses to ensure that we get value for money and we look at every program, every policy, every service, and we put people first. We try to, again, through the Minister of Finance, a budget. We uh, are putting forward a budget, a responsible and sustainable budget, a very thoughtful budget that protects what matters most to people. But we made it very clear to Spons. all of our partners, whether they be Ontario's 444 municipalities, that we expected them to do the same. We expected them to review every policy, every program, every service, and put people first. Final supplementary. Yesterday, we heard from Toronto Mayor John Tory Speaker and Guelph Mayor Cam Guthrie, both of whom are speaking out about the Premier's thoughtless cuts, both of whom are or were well-respected card-carrying members of the Progressive Conservative Party, and they were both very clear. Despite what the Premier likes to call it, what we're seeing aren't efficiencies, they are, and I quote, 
straight up cuts. Why is the Premier so committed to forcing painful cuts and painful tax increases at the same time that will only hurt Ontario families and make Mike more expensive? Why is he a tax, 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 cut, cut, cut Premier Speaker? Members will please take their seats. The question has been referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, I want to remind uh, the honourable member that back in, uh, in March, uh, before the end of the fiscal year, we provided 405 municipalities, $200 million unconditionally to be able to help drive efficiencies, to be able to have service delivery reviews if they felt it was important, to be able to modernize their IT, to be able to work with some of their neighbours on shared service agreements. This was uh, the largest municipal modernization fund that has been provided in many, many years across Ontario's municipalities. And we made it flexible. We made it, it so that one size doesn't fit all, so that if a community decides they want to be more efficient and more effective, that we put some money into it for them, that we gave them the opportunity to have those type of conversations. But make no mistake, Speaker, Response. we inherited a financial mess from the previous government, and we ask all of our partners, especially Ontario's 444 municipalities, to work with us, to continue to consult the groups that the, that the Honourable Member— Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. Member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, uh, this question is for the Premier. For months, this government has assured us they are listening to Ontarians when it comes to the future of public education, pointing to their call-ins and their online surveys as proof. But it's clear, Mr. Speaker, that students and parents feel they haven't been heard. The public backlash to their education cuts is real, and it is growing. Yep. Something else that appears to have grown substantially is the cost of those so-called consultations. The ministry's initial contract for service cited a maximum cost of a $200,000. Now we've obtained government estimates showing that the total cost came in at $900,000 and $73,000. Can the Premier explain how this government managed to spend nearly a million dollars on a so-called consultation he was only going to ignore? Questions to the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. I, you know something? I, I, get, I get tired about hearing from the radical left about cut, cut, cut. What, what I want to say is this province better off now than it was when we got elected before. You ask any financial advisor, the 123,000 jobs, unprecedented by the way, that was created because we created the environment for companies to thrive and prosper and grow. And when they thrive, prosper and grow, they hire employees, Mr. Speaker. We focus on what matters. As I said earlier, we put $90 million to 100,000 seniors for dental care. We put $2 billion for child care that matters to working families. We ended up putting $1.3 billion into health care, protecting all teachers, added another $1.3 $1.6 billion, $700 million more into education. Here, here. Our economy is on fire. We have more jobs out there available than we have people to fill those jobs. Ontario is smiling. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary questions. Mr. Speaker, I understand why this makes the Premier uncomfortable. Uh, every day we are hearing new reports of teachers, and this is back to the Premier. We're hearing new reports of teachers and education workers being handed their walking papers, courses being dropped from student schedules, and school boards facing major budget shortfalls as a result of this government's cuts. Yet this government somehow found a million dollars to pay for 37 te telephone call-ins and an online questionnaire only to ignore the results. Given the cost of this consultation, Order. the Premier should be able to tell us how many people asked for their kids to be jammed into larger classes, how many asked for fewer adults in schools and fewer course options for students, and how many said their child deserved less from their education system. Let's get the Premier. 
Minister of Education. Refer to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. So, Speaker, I would like to share with everybody listening today and to the member opposite as well as her party that we are listening and we're getting it right. And you know what? The fact of the matter is our consultation was absolutely historic and we listened. Do you know what? People were asking us to conduct a board governance review. So what did we do? We included it in our budget. And people were telling us Indigenous studies are very important. So what did we do? In our budget, we've recognized where from grades 9 to 12, we're introducing an absolutely encompassed curriculum that our, our Indigenous partners are going to be pleased with. People have asked us to make our education system more accountable, and that's what we're doing. And that's why we're looking forward to working with our labour partners and our education partners to realize that there are efficiencies at the administration level so Response. that we can absolutely focus in on a great learning environment in the, the classroom for teachers and students across Ontario. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. The Minister uh, is responsible for Ontario's new home warranty program run by Tarion. Now, many Ontarians have voiced their concern with Tarion and have called for the reforms to the structure and practices of the organization. Mm -hmm. In February, the Minister announced our government's plan to transform Tarion to ensure it better protects new home buyers. The Minister outlined a number of initiatives our government is taking to fix Ontario's new home warranty program. These changes, of course, are even more important now uh, that our government has announced its Housing Supply Action Plan. More homes for Ontarians means more new home buyers in need of protection. Mr. Speaker, could the minister outline the initiatives his ministry has undertaken to transform Tarion? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my friend, the Honourable Member for Willowdale MPP, Stan Cho, for his great work and representation of his here, here, what people a guy. in Willowdale. And for the great question. Oh, stands a beauty. Our government is taking action to protect hardworking Ontarians when they make one of the biggest purchases in their life, a new home. We recognize that consumers across the province have serious concerns with Tarion, and we are committed to fixing it. Mr. Speaker, our plan to transform Tarion includes establishing a separate regulator from Tarion for new home builders and vendors to address conflicts of interest. We're exploring the feasibility of a multi-provider insurance model for new home warranties and protections in Ontario. We're introducing proposed legislative amendments that will enable the government to require Tarion to make executive and board compensation publicly available and to move to a more balanced, skill-based board composition. And we're introducing new initiatives to better inform and protect purchasers of cancelled condominium projects. Speaker, these measures will help ensure Response. that going forward, Tarion is accountable, transparent, and provides quality service for the people of Ontario. Wow, that was yeah. thorough. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and through you, thank you to the Minister for his response. I know Ontarians will be glad to hear the actions the Minister is taking to transform the program and strengthen protections for home buyers. In addition to pre protecting new home buyers, our government is committed to ensuring more Ontarians can finally have the opportunity to enter the housing market. I know the Minister has a key role to play in our government's plan to expand housing availability for the people of Ontario. In addition to the changes the minister just outlined, our government's housing supply action plan also contains additional reforms to tarry on. Speaker, could the minister outline these aspects of the transformation and how these changes will help protect Ontarians and expand access to new homes in this great province? Questions to the minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the honourable member, MPP Cho. Stan is the man for the people of Willowdale. He is the man. The member is absolutely correct he is the man. that a key component of our government's plan to improve housing availability for insurance is strengthening protections for new home buyers by transforming Tarion. Our proposed changes address key consumer concerns hurried during consultations. We're doing this by supporting greater quality in new home construction through proactive risk-based inspections during construction. We're enabling greater transparency through access to information on the track record of builders, Ontarians Ontario Builder Directory, and we're enhancing dispute resolution so it is quick, fair, and that consistent decisions can be made. These measures are in addition to the initiatives announced earlier this year to transform Tarion and supports our plan to build more housing and reduce housing costs. Mr. Speaker, buying a home is likely the most significant financial decision most insurance ever make in their life. Response. Our plan ensures more insurance will be able to make that step and that they will be protected when they do so. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. 
Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier seems completely unable to curb his government spending of taxpayer dollars, the people's money, on foreign junkets and the gravy train of six-figure jobs for the Premier's friends. That hasn't stopped him from insisting that he knows best when it comes to spending at the City of Toronto. Now that Conservative mayors in Guelph and London are calling out this Premier for his reckless cuts, will the Premier be taking his show on the road, touring Ontario and offering budget advice to municipalities suffering from his Ford government cuts? Questions to the Premier. Uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, what, what the member doesn't realize, I guess he's never experienced it, when, when you're involved in an organization, a government this size, and it's been a bankrupt government, around the world all the investors ended up leaving, they didn't want to invest any longer. You have to go out to some of the world's largest investors, which I did with our all-star champion finance minister, were able to raise funds to pay for their debt. That, that's ironic. We're raising funds over in the U.S. to pay for your debt. That's right. Yeah. We went out there. We attracted Fortune 500 companies. They're excited. They're opening up jobs here. That's what it is all about. That's why our Minister of Economic Development went over to India again to tell the world that Ontario is open for business, open for jobs, open for investment, and it's coming in. You can see it coming in. Response. Our jobs have been created, 123,000 new jobs and billions and billions of dollars of new investment because of this government. Here, here. Supplementary question. Rambling. Speaker, uh, what the Premier seems to conveniently forget is that companies like Chrysler, GM and Ford started cutting jobs the minute after he was elected as the Premier of this province. So maybe you should check the facts before, before he starts rambling off incoherence. Speaker, the fact is that municipal leaders, even card-carrying ones, know that this Ford government budget means. It means higher property taxes or cuts to services, or both, Speaker. Now we know that the Premier loves hiking property taxes because that's exactly what he endorsed at City Hall to pay for the Scarborough subway. Speaker, does the Premier understand that sometimes uh, Conservative municipal leaders don't want a Doug Ford-style cut-and-cut government? I'm going to remind all members that we refer to each other by our ministerial title or our riding name as applicable, not by our surnames. Premier to reply. Again, through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, we're creating an environment for companies to thrive. People are thriving. You ask any business owner, from the person that has a convenience store to the companies that employ thousands of people. You ask them who they support. They support this government here, here, here. because we're lowering taxes, lowering hydro bills, putting money back into the common folks' pocket. We ended up giving a tax break that they're paying 0% tax to the lowest income people in the entire province. That's a, over a billion dollars. They're paying 0% tax. Because our government has a theory, Mr. Speaker, you put more money into the people's pocket, they'll go out and spend it that they might otherwise not be able to spend when you have the debt, when you're being taxed to death, when you see a carbon tax that is absolutely destroying the economy across Canada. People are paying more for gas paying more for heating bills. We're doing the opposite. Exactly. We actually lowered gas by four and a half cents. Yep. We lowered the home heating bills. Yep. We are focused on what's best for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga, East Cooksville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Yesterday, I'm going to ask the members to come to order to allow the member from Mississauga East Cooksville this time to ask his question in such a way that I can hear him. Once again, I apologize to the member. Yesterday, another report was released confirming the federal government's failed border policies. The Auditor General found Canada was ill-equipped to deal with the surge in illegal border crossers seeking asylum by crossing at unauthorized ports of entry. More than 42,000 asylum seekers have entered Canada between official border crossings since this crisis began two years ago. Can the minister please explain to this House how our government is managing under the federal government's failure? Very good question. To 
the Minister of Children, Thank you very Community much, and Social Speaker. Services. I really appreciate the advocacy for the member of Mississauga, East Cooksville, who has uh, come to this country and made a great life. We're very proud of you in the, in the government of course, people contributions to your community, but also to our government. And I appreciate the question because, Speaker, this is something we have consistently raised in the government for the past 11 months, where there is a port of entry that is uh, not known as um as a legal or authorized port in Quebec, which uh, is sending thousands of people uh, across the border into Ontario, which is costing our taxpayers $200 million in growing. But don't take our word for it. The Federal Auditor General has just agreed with the Parliamentary Budget Officer, as well as the Toronto Neighbourhood Studies process, to suggest that this is a, a process that we cannot continue to uh, support in the province of Ontario because two things. One is the, the Canadians do not have a confidence in the border, as you know, uh, federal Border crossing Response. is uh, a, a sole jurisdiction of the federal government. However, the downstream cost on our shelter systems in our two largest cities in Ottawa and Toronto is over 80. Thank you. Thank you. The opposition will come to order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After the previous Liberal government failed to stand up to their fellow. Order counterparts, it is refreshing to have a Here minister the will who will order. fight for Ontario's taxpayers. It appears the Prime Minister and Minister responsible feel they can spend their way out of this issue. The 2019 budget committed $208 million in new funds for the Immigration and Refugee Board to help clear the backlog. Speaker, it's hard to imagine how we'll clear such a backlog as more illegal border crossers arrive each day. Can the minister please tell us how we are standing up for Ontario's taxpayers? Good supplement. Minister, to reply. I have joined every single premier who joined our premier, Premier Ford, across this great province, across this great nation, uh, through our territories as well as the other provinces, in calling on the federal government to pay for its bills at its broken border crossing. You don't have to take my word for it. Every single premier of every political stripe in this country signed on with Premier Ford. The parliamentary budget officer, who is an independent officer of the federal parliament, has agreed. The, the auditor general federally has also agreed. That's why we continue to call on Minister Bill Blair and Minister Ahmed Hussein to provide Ontario with $200 million, which is $84 million in shelter costs in our two largest cities, and $90 million in social assistance costs and growing, and over $20 million in education costs. The reality is simple, Speaker. The federal government has no control over its border, but it does have control over its finances, Response. and we want our $200 million. Order. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Families devastated by flooding across Ontario were relieved to hear the government announce that disaster relief assistance will be available as they prepare to put things back together. But they're worried that the promise of assistance will dry up as soon as the cameras go away. The minister has promised to address the long delays and cumbersome paperwork that have afflicted this program and left people without support they desperately needed. Will the Premier tell people applying today for disaster relief today when they can expect the support they're applying for? Questions to the Premier. Uh, for, for, for you, Mr. Speaker, my heart breaks when I went up to Muskoka, up to Ottawa. I've been up to Muskoka uh, several times and Ottawa several times to make sure I, I, I saw the damage myself, made sure our Minister of Natural Resources, the Minister of Environment order. was involved. I gave my word to uh, the mayor of Muskoka Lakes and the Bracebridge mayor and the Huntsville mayor that we'd put a task force together. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm so glad to announce uh, yesterday we sat down with the, the ministries. We're putting a task force together. It's taken us two days to get that going, which is unbelievable in government, but our government moves quick when, when uh, emergencies happen. So we're reaching out today, actually, to the three mayors, going to be heading up there again to pay them a visit, to sit down, and we're going to have the Ministry of Natural Resources, the Ministry of Environment, plus the three municipalities up in the Muskoka region, along with uh, the Ottawa Response. region, and we're going to come up with uh, great ideas how we can take care of the watershed up there to make sure we can prevent the flooding in the past and control the water a lot better than what's happened over uh, the last year. Hear him. Supplementary question. The speaker, families who have watched their homes disappear under floodwaters shouldn't be left waiting for years for the help as they put things back together. Following the tornado that hit the Ottawa region last year, 
only seven of 111 applicants have received the disaster funding they applied for. And residents of Windsor flooding in 2017 are still waiting for the assistance they applied for. Will the Premier be clear today that help will come when the cameras are gone and commit that these people will receive support when they need it, not years from now? Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks. Thanks, Speaker, and I, I'm, I'm glad that the, the Premier mentioned the, uh, the task force, and I want, to thank, uh, th I want to thank Premier Ford and also all of my ministerial colleagues, including my, uh, my seatmate, um, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, for uh, all of their work that we're doing. As the Premier said, the safety of the people of Ontario is our, our top concern uh, of our government and my ministry specifically. I want to thank uh, all of the first responders, all of the municipal staff, and everyone who's on the ground, inclu including the men and women of our Canadian Armed Forces, for assisting in this, uh, in this terrible disaster. Uh, as the member will know, we uh, activated the Disaster Recovery Assistance for Ontarians program uh, back at uh, the end of April in uh, the Renfrew and the Pembroke area, which I, I travelled to with, uh, with the minister. Uh, uh, last week, uh, Huntsville and Bracebridge is the point referenced, and as well yesterday we uh, we authorized Dreo in uh, Kawartha Lakes in the Ottawa region, um, including Clarence Rockland, the Township of Alfred and Plantagenet, and the Township of Champlain. We'll continue to work with our municipal partners, always wanting to make the, the program improve if possible. Good job. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, public health in Ontario has embraced a preventative health care strategy that not only saves money but saves lives. And one would think that this government would understand that, but unfortunately, they put ideology ahead of science and data. Speaker, through you to the Premier, can he explain how cutting funding to public health will help make our health care system more efficient? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much for the question. We are modernizing our public health system. It's important to do that to make sure that people are protected and receive the essential services that they need. There's been a lot of incorrect information out there about the effects of these changes. They are small changes over the course of three years. They are bringing forward. We want to make sure that local units can concentrate on the things that are most important, like making sure that children are being vaccinated. We're in dangerous territory in some parts of Ontario with respect to that because we require a certain percentage of the population to be vaccinated in order for everyone to be safe. We want to make sure that nutrition programs are going to continue. That is continuing with funding from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services and that children with special needs get the help they need as well as, as women expecting children. So all of those things are Response. essential. We recognize that. That is something that, with the funds that the local units are receiving from the provincial government, they will be able to continue. We have to focus on priorities. We have to <coughs> focus on what is most important. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, back to the Premier. If the uh, government will not accept science and data, how about some history? Under Mike Harris, massive cuts were made to health care, and there was a breaking point, Mr. Speaker. The SARS outbreak took place under the 50 government side come health to formula. Recognizing the crucial role that public health plays in preventing outbreaks, the former Liberal government uh, increased public health uh, spending by 25 per cent that year. We know that uh, this government wants to take us back to the 90s and only fund half of public health, but Premier, you have a duty to look ahead, to strengthen our public health care system, not to undermine it. So, Speaker, through you, how does the Premier think that these massive cuts will help prevent a future public health care crisis? question has been referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would say let's look at the facts and let's look at the math. We inherited a $15 billion deficit as a result of things that your government did. $15 billion. And do we have a, a better health care system, a better education system, a better financial system? Certainly not. We have to take the steps necessary in order to make sure that we have a sustainable services for the future. We are protected what matters. Health care, education matter. And we are taking every step possible to make sure that we do our responsibility to the people of Ontario to be responsible.
responsible financial stewards, and we are expecting municipalities to do the same. With the funding they will be receiving in public health from the province, they will be able to do it if they concentrate on the essential priorities, and Ms. I'm Bonner. sure that they will, and we look forward to working with them in order to do that. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the, the rising trend of opioid overdoses across the country and in Ontario is a public health issue that demands action. In an effort to fight back against the opioid crisis, I recently introduced my first private member's bill, which, if passed, would mandate that all police services across Ontario be trained in the administration of naloxone. Naloxone is a life-saving medication that can temporarily reverse the effects of an opioid overdose and allow for medical help to arrive. Mr. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain to this House how our government is empowering police services across this province to save lives? Just to the Solicitor General. Thank you very much, and thank you to the member for Mississauga Centre. You know, as a registered nurse, I know that she has a particular interest and insight into this issue and how we can do more work to support our everyday heroes on the front line. Here, here. Last fall, our government made changes so police officers would not be subjected to an automatic criminal investigation when they used naloxone in an unsuccessful attempt to revive someone with an overdose. It was the right thing to do. This amendment enabled police officers to carry out their duties without fear of facing a criminal investigation, but more importantly, it helped save lives. Here, here. Police should be subject to the same rules as other first responders when administering this potentially life-saving measure. Police officers are often the first to arrive on the scene of an emergency. In a medical emergency, they do what any first responder would do. They try to save a life. These changes were important. They sent a message Response. to our frontline responders that we are going to have their backs when, when they need it. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Minister, for your answer and for your continued advocacy and steadfast leadership when it comes to ensuring the safety of our province. Mr. Speaker, we know that many overdoses happen in a victim's home, and police officers are often the first to arrive at the scene. The brave police officers in my riding and the rest of the province will now be treated the same as firefighters and paramedics when it comes to the admi administration of naloxone. This is the right thing to do for our men and women in uniform who are key first responders in the opioid crisis. Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please share more about our government's commitment to supporting public safety in Ontario? Solicitor General. It would be an honour, Speaker. You know, in less than a year, our government has done more to support respect and support public safety heroes than, frankly, the previous government did in 15 years. Here, here. We fixed and passed legislation that restores respect to the brave men and women of the police and puts public safety first. We announced two phases of our plan to crack down on gun violence and break up the gangs who prey on our young people within our communities. We recently highlighted our government's commitment to move ahead with building a new, modern correctional facility in Thunder Bay here, here. that will keep correctional officers safe and better protect the people of Ontario. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, we're just getting started. And I I will have more to announce soon. Here, Thank here. you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kiwetno. Miigwech, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Recently, the government proposed legislative changes uh, to the Endangered Species Act, reviewing the Far North Act, and changes to the Environment, Environmental Assessment Act. The language used uh, by the government to describe these proposals is that. To, that this is all about efficiencies and nothing else. But these changes can't take place without real, prior, and informed cons consultation and consent of First Nations. What is the government's plan for meaningful consultation with all citizens, including First Nations, before moving ahead with these changes? The question is addressed to the Deputy Premier. Minister of the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I want to again state uh, that uh, we continue to want to engage uh, in our Indigenous peoples and, and all of our communities about uh, our environmental policies. Uh, I speak, uh, you know, as part of our More Homes, More Choice Act. We've worked very, uh, you know, very directly with the Minister of Environment, uh, Climate Change, and Parks. Uh, conservation of parks. 
Um, our government is working uh, very diligently as part of our More Homes, More Choice plan. We brought forward a, a key piece of our Made in Ontario environmental plan that will help turn uh, our housing crisis um, forward. So I, I appreciate the members' uh, uh, comments about some of these environmental. They're, they're still uh, posted on the environmental registry for comment. We're still engaging uh, a variety Thoughts? of stakeholders. Uh, and again, I, I, I look forward to uh, the feedback that we get. We, we have received a tremendous amount of feedback from the public and Indigenous communities to date. Supplementary question. Miigwech, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Acting Premier. The purpose of the current Environmental Assessment Act is for the betterment of the people of Ontario for pro by providing the protection, conservation, and wise management on, 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 uh, of Ontario's environment. The Matawa chiefs were working on an enhanced environmental assessment process with Ontario and have insights, strong insights actually, on making improvements to environmental laws that can bring certainty for communities and industry alike. Why has not the Premier not responded and not taken the time to meet with Matawa chiefs on the Ring of Fire developments and the approach and including First Nations and decision making in the north. Members will please take their seats. Minister. Speaker, through you to the honourable member, consultation uh, with uh, our Indigenous communities is very important to us, whether it be in my housing supply action plan. Uh, whether it be in our Made in Ontario Environment Plan. I know that uh, if the Minister of Indigenous Affairs was, uh, was uh, available today, he would talk about the extensive consultation that we've had uh, regarding a number of these, uh, these matters. I appreciate a number of uh, folks in the room, and uh, I will pass along uh, some of their comments uh, inv involving our Made in Order. Ontario Environment Plan. Um, again, uh, from my perspective and some of the uh, things that I'm carrying forward in this legislation, things like the uh, changes to our Endangered Species Act, things for our uh, Environmental Assessment Act, which I might say a number of the things that we're exempting under the Environmental Assessment Act are very low-risk projects that in no other jurisdiction Spons. in Canada they are part of the environmental assessment process. These are things like snow plowing, uh, creating bike lanes, creating uh, uh, community parks. No other jurisdiction includes those in the environmental assessment process. There's not one other location that does that. Sure. Uh, again, consultation is important. We want to continue. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the amazing Minister of Transportation. We all know that our roads and highways are among the safest in North America, but I'm sure that we can all agree that there's always more that can be done to ensure that Ontarians are safe getting from point A to point B. I know that there are a number of safety, safety measures in the Getting Ontario Moving Act that, if passed, will increase the safety of every person who uses our roads, highways and bridges. The people of Ontario expect our government to make the roads safer for them, and we are doing just that. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Transportation share with the Legislature some of the proposed safety measures in the Getting Ontario Moving Act? Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker, and I thank the member from Thornhill for that question, and uh, she truly is a, a champion for transit in her area, and I can't remember a day which I haven't heard from her on the transit file. But, Mr. Speaker, last week I was thrilled to table the Getting Ontario Moving Act, as well as a number of proposed regulatory changes that will cut red tape, save businesses and taxpayers time and money, and help keep Ontario's roads the safest in North America. We are doing this because it's our fundamental belief that we need to put the people first in everything we do, and the people of Ontario expect us to keep our roads safe. Mr. Speaker, we are proposing uh, increased fines for slow-moving drivers that travel in the left-hand lane because when people drive dangerously slow, they're putting the safety of others at risk. And if passed, our legislation will make learning to drive safer by introducing a new offence for any driving instructor that violates a zero blood alcohol or drug presence Response. requirement. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to sharing more in my supplemental. Supplementary question. Thank you to the Minister for his great response. Our government continues to keep the people of Ontario front of mind in every decision we make. 
In fact, no matter what the service, regulation, program or policy, we want to hear from all Ontarians and involve them in decision-making. Mr. Speaker, our number one priority is keeping the people of Ontario safe, whether at home, work or during their commute. This is why we are working to ensure we have a safe and efficient transportation network. It is important that we continue to work together to find ways to make sure Ontario roads remain among the safest in North America. Will the Minister of Transportation please share more about the proposed regulations and safety measures? Minister. Thanks again for that question. Mr. Speaker, we, we do have a number of proposed uh, safety measures in our bill and regulations, and we're proposing stronger fines for driving carelessly around maintenance and construction workers, tow truck drivers, and recovery workers. We're allowing motorcyclists to use the HOV lanes, a much safer part of the road for them to use. And as I announced a couple weeks ago, we'll give municipalities the tools they need to target drivers who threaten the safety of children crossing roads on their way home or to school. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians expect the government to enact laws and regulations that keep them safe, especially our highways. We are committed to increasing the safety of every person who uses our roads, highways and bridges. And Mr. Speaker, I don't know why the NDP, the opposition, voted against these proposed amendments and changes. They're all for the benefit of Ontarians to make our roads safer. Hopefully when second reading comes around, they'll hop on board and support our government with these changes. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Um, today, we are all wearing pins, all members of the House, to commemorate and recognize Children's Mental Health Week. Recognition, Speaker, is long overdue, but the time for action is now. Children in this province shouldn't have to wait more than 18 months in order to access the vital help they need. According to the Children Mental he uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario, one in five children and youth has a mental health issue in our province, but only one out of six of these young people will get the support and specialized treatment that they need. Yet this government has provided less than a quarter of the $150 million that CMHO needs to support children and youth with mental health services. Will the Premier reconsider and provide the full funding needed to treat youth mental illness, prevent youth suicides, and prevent children from unnecessary hospital visits here in our province? Members, please take your seats. I recognize the Deputy Premier in reply. Thank you. Well, I certainly uh, would agree with the member opposite that we do need uh, investments in our mental health and addiction system, particularly with respect to children's mental health. That's why during the election campaign we committed to spending $3.8 billion over 10 years, matching the federal commitment of $1.9 billion. We are making sure that we make investments in the proper way. That's what the people of Ontario expect us to do. Just the other day, on Monday, I made an announcement of an additional $174 million in mental health and funding. We want to make sure that we reduce wait times for children receiving mental health care. Yep. We know that students are also in need of additional funding. Our colleges and universities are being overwhelmed by the mental health and addictions needs of their students, but we need to do it in a careful way. We need to make the right investments. And so, as a matter of fact, I am meeting with Children's Mental Health Ontario and the Youth Action Committee to talk about their suggestions for how we can improve mental health services for young people, for children and young people. We have been hearing order. from many groups. We've had over order. 19 consultations Response. so far, but we need to hear from the people who are receiving services or who need to receive services. So I'm looking forward to. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Acting Premier. Today, a group of young Ontarians have come to Queen's Park to ask the Premier to invest in their future. As the Minister says, she'll be meeting with them later. These pins and ministerial statements are not enough when young people's mental health initiatives continue to be underfunded in this province, Speaker. These gestures aren't going to help children who remain waitlisted for over 18 Government months come to order. for the emergency mental health supports that they need. The Premier promised to match the federal government in mental health funding by committing $3.9 billion over 10 years. But this year's budget for uh, mental health is actually all just federal money. There's no new commitment from this province. Ontario's children cannot wait any longer, Mr. Speaker. Can the Premier please tell us why this government has once again failed to invest in young people here in Ontario? Members, please take your seats. Minister to reply. 
I would thank you, Speaker. And through you, I have to say I completely disagree with what the member has just indicated. We have made the commitment to spend $3.8 billion over 10 years. And as a matter of fact, with respect to the announcement that I made on Monday of an additional $174 million, which was part of our budget plan and which will include more supports for children and youth, we are going to make sure that children get mental health assistance in schools as well as in the community. We're also going to make sure that people who are homeless are going to receive housing supports. People with severe mental illness get better support through mobile crisis teams working with the Solicitor General's office, and that young youth and adults get faster access to addictions treatment. But we certainly recognize the need for faster access for children and youth to get services and connected services. There's also a problem with youth transitioning Response. into adult services where they get dropped when they're 18 and then they can't get picked up again for services. We want to work with children and youth. We want to hear from them directly about their IQ. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's government was elected with a mandate to improve public safety across this province and to provide the hardworking frontline staff in our correctional facilities with the tools and the resources they need to accomplish their duties safely and effectively. Each year during the first week of May, we celebrate the significant contribution made by correctional officers, probation and parole officers, nurses, social workers, recreational staff, and so many others to keep Ontario safe. Mr. Speaker, to help mark this important week, could the Solicitor General please explain to this House how our government is supporting the efforts of frontline heroes in our correctional facilities? Questions to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Peterborough from Northumberland, Peterborough South for this important question. You know, whether it's behind institutional walls or in our communities, correctional officers and their staff are essential partners in Ontario's justice system. Through their hard work and dedication, these professionals perform important supervision, care, and rehabilitation duties and help keep our communities safe. Their diligence and professionalism does not go unnoticed by our government. Over the course of the coming week, the member from Brampton South, my excellent parliamentary assistant, Prabhmeet Singh, will be visiting correctional facilities and probation and parole officers across the province. These meetings are another opportunity to learn firsthand the frontline workers about the challenges they experience in their day-to-day -day work keeping our Order. communities safe. Let me be Response. clear. Our government will always support correctional staff in their vital work, which is essential to protecting Ontario communities and families. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for her response and for taking the time to meet with frontline workers in my community. I will tell you that my constituents are heartened to hear this government's commitment to public safety and frontline workers like those at Brookside and Warkworth Corrections in my riding. This week, the province of Ontario Correctional Services staff will pay tribute to those who have fallen in the line of duty at the annual Correctional Services Ceremony of Remembrance at Queen's Park. Ontario formally honours the contributions and sacrifices of the province's Correctional Services staff at this solemn ceremony each year. Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General tell us how our government is working with frontline heroes in our correctional facilities to provide a safer Ontario? Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. And I from uh, across all party lines and uh, the, the general public actually participate in the ceremony tomorrow because, it, as he spoke, it is very emotional and very important to acknowledge. Though it goes unseen by most Ontarians, the vital work of correctional service professionals help make Ontario one of the safest jurisdictions in the world. We do not take this for granted, which is why we renew our commitment to corrections officers, probation and parole, and other correctional staff. Over the past several months, our government has made improvements at adult correction facilities across the province, including better health and wellness supports for correctional officers, reconfirming Ontario's commitment to build a new, modern complex in Thunder Bay, expanding the female unit at Monteith Correctional Complex, having a de dedicated canine unit at the Elgin Middlesex Response. Detention Centre, and increasing safety at the Kenora Jail by upgrading infrastructure and strengthening partnership between the correction staff Opposition and the police to order. You know, If the NDP members actually spoke to their corrections officers, they would hear about the investments Thank you. Thank you very much. Order. 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 
Next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This Conservative government is making massive concessions to the auto insurance industry in their regressive new plan. Right there, in black and white, the government is planning to allow insurance companies to jack up drivers' insurance rates even more if they don't have perfect credit mm -hmm. by allowing insurance companies to ask for your credit history to determine how much you have to pay. That will be devastating to families in areas like Humber River, Black Creek, Brampton, Scarborough, even the Premier's own riding, who are already overpaying because of the neighbourhood they live in. What you pay for auto insurance should be based on your driving record, not where you live and not based on your credit rating. Premier, what on earth does credit rating have to do with your driving record? The question to the Premier. Minister of Finance. The to the Minister of Finance. Thank you very much uh, for the question. You know, it's so clear, Speaker, that the uh, Liberal NDP system of failed stretch goals on auto insurance is broken. It is completely broken. They have done nothing about this. Our plan, our plan that we proposed in the budget, will provide choice. Will provide choice for families. It's uh, putting the drivers first. It will allow Order. the drivers to be able to select items for their own insurance. It will allow Opposition the insurance to companies order. to offer options to drivers that they can't option, uh, that they are no longer or aren't available today. This is an opportunity, Speaker, to modernize, to digitize. You'll be able to use an app now for your driver insurance instead of having it on a pink form in your glove compartment. We're modernizing government. We're uh, transforming government. We're digitizing government, and auto insurance is a big part of this program, Speaker. Absolutely. Supplementary question. I, I see that the, the minister doesn't want to talk about that dark secret in their auto insurance plan. Yeah. The Conservative government voted against my bill, the Lower Automobile Insurance Act, that would have lowered auto insurance premiums by, for millions of Ontario's drivers. According to economist and auto insurance expert Dr. Fred Lazar, my bill could have lowered how much drivers have to pay for insurance by a billion dollars a year province-wide. Instead, this government is giving rich auto insurance companies new discriminatory tools to go after drivers yep. based on their credit rating. Why is this government siding with rich auto insurance companies over Ontario drivers who are being gouged? That's right. Minister. Premier, drivers across Ontario have been pushing for 15 long years for change to this file, and we are bringing that. And rather than meaningful change, uh, the meaningful change from us, we continue to hear these uh, programs from the NDP and the Liberals that go absolutely nowhere. So let's hear from a couple of professionals. The Canadian Automobile Association, the CAA Insurance, is pleased to see that the 2019 provincial budget Budget, provides Ontario motorists greater choice around auto insurance so that coverage better suits individual needs. Individual needs. The Insurance Bureau of Canada, quote, the Ontario government's multi-year plan to fix auto insurance is a win for consumers. These changes will give consumers greater choice in their coverage and better control over the price they pay for auto insurance. Response. Speaker, I'm, I'm, it, it's so awful to see that this government, it, the, the uh, opposition is not going to support this budget and bring choice and lower costs for insurance for the families of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Hey. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today my question is for my neighbouring Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Forestry, the rather quiet neighbour. <laughs> Our government for the people, we understand just how important the forestry industry is for the people of Ontario, and I know both the Minister and I are personally aware of the impact. Yet for 15 years, the previous government, they ignored this extremely important industry and they let, us, let it fall right by the wayside, like completely ignored it. Well, I know the Minister of Natural Resources has been working hard to make Ontario open for business and open for jobs. So can the Minister update this House on how our government is directly investing in the forestry industry? Questions to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, my neighbour from Hastings, uh, Lennox and Addington, for that question. 
He's right. We are making Ontario open for business and open for jobs. I recently visited Killaloo to see firsthand how our investment of $5.5 million over five years has helped to protect local jobs at Ben Oakham & Son, a family-run sawmill. It was great to be there with Dean Felliber and his wife, Tanya. Dean is the fourth generation at Oakham & Son. It is one of Eastern Ontario's largest lumber producers and the province's biggest producer of red and white pine lumber. This investment will help protect over 100 jobs and help the sawmill compete with anybody in the world. It has been too long since the government invested in such an important industry, and I can tell you that the supporting success stories like Ben Oakham & Son is just the beginning for this government because we stand 100 per cent behind our forestry sector. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, thank you, Minister, and then certainly I can advise all people, if you've never been to Killaloo, you're definitely missing something. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Minister, it's really exciting to see our government taking measures to make Ontario really the best place in the world to do business. It's one of our government's number one priorities, to grow the economy and help create and protect our jobs. Mr. Speaker, I'm getting really, really tired of seeing this $15 billion industry just neglected and flushed down the toilet by 15 years of inaction of this previous government. So I know this investment by our government and the development of a forestry strategy are only a very few number of the ways that this minister is helping companies like Ben Hookham and Son continue to thrive here in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, could our minister please inform this House on how this industry and this investment is beneficial to the entire forestry industry? Yes. Minister. Thank you for, very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member for a supplementary. You know, since being founded in 1956, Ben Oakham & Son has gone from a small circular sawmill producing about 2 million board feet to two sawmills that produce over 31 million board feet each per year. When we support producers like Ben Oakham, when they succeed, so do the harvesters that provide their logs and the other producers that depend on their products. This was not just an investment in Ben Oakham & Son, but an investment in the community and the forestry sector as a whole. We're creating an environment where jobs will be created in the forestry industry, which I have so much confidence in the future of this industry as we develop a forestry strategy and send the message to our forestry partners that we're behind them, not trying to stand in their way. And I hope that my colleagues on the other side in the NDP will stand with us and support our forestry industry as we try to bring it forward into the 21st century. Thank you. That concludes question period for this morning. Point of order. The Minister of Government and Consumer Services has informed me he has a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to correct my record. This morning, when I was speaking about the Housing Supply Action Bill, I uh, stated inadvertently that we had 283 surplus properties that we'll be disposing of in government and putting those monies back into the programs that we value most. It should have actually been 243 surplus properties, Mr. Speaker, and we're looking forward to selling all those and bringing that money back to the people of Ontario. It is entirely in order for members to correct their own record, and I appreciate that. Uh, the next one, the next one with a point of order, is a member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I hate to steal your thunder, but I want to welcome to the House uh, my friends from Faith Lutheran Church, uh, Willem Hil Wilhelm Hilgendach, Art Oswald, William Neeb, Elizabeth Mongen, and former member here, my friend and mentor, David M Newman from the 34th Parliament and his beautiful wife, Alfreda. Welcome to this, our people's house. Yes, welcome back to the legislature. Government House Leader appears to have a point of order. Yeah, point of order. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Speaker. I just wanted to pass along to the House because a lot of people have been asking about uh, funeral arrangements for uh, the member from King Vaughan, uh, Stephen Lecce, and his mother, uh, Teresa. I can tell you that uh, uh, Vessio Funeral Home in uh, Woodbridge uh, will be a visitation on uh, Thursday from 2 to 4 and 6 to 9, and then 6 to 9 on Friday night as well. And the funeral mass uh, will be taking place on Saturday morning at 11.30, and that's at St. Margaret Mary Roman Catholic Church on Highway 27. I just wanted to pass that along to everyone. Thank you very much for that information. Uh, Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry, first of all. I wanted to welcome uh, Raymond Hood, uh, the former executive director of the counseling and support services of Stormont Dundas, <coughs> South Glengarry, or uh, Glengarry, and welcome to Queen's Park. Is it a point of order? Member for Richmond Hill on a point of order. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome Mrs. Tracy McGuthers, Executive Director, and New Shaw Hutchin, Director of Counseling and Group Services for Catholic Community Services of York Region. Mr. Speaker, Family Service Ontario and its 47 members agencies are hosting a brief luncheon in committee room 228 to 223 at noon, and I encourage all members to attend to learn about the long history of providing community-based mental health and addiction services in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for Waterloo on a point of order. Of uh, Counseling Collaborative of Waterloo Region, Lisa Aki from Interfaith Community Counseling Centre and Horizon Family and Community Services, and Diane McGregor from KW Counseling Services are also here today, and we'll be joining them for the reception. Thank you. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for third reading of Bill 87, an act to amend various statutes related to energy. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
going to ask the members to please take their seats. On May the 1st, 2019, Mr. Rickford moved third reading of Bill 87, an act to amend various statutes related to energy. Mr. Clark has moved that the question now be put. All those in favour of Mr. Clark's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith, Bay of Quincy. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethan. Mr. Bethan. Mr. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabus. Mr. Yakabus. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettit. Mr. Pettit. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough. Mr. Cho Scarborough. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Dow. Mr. Dow. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalandra. Mr. Kalandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusendover. Ms. Kusendover. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Cara Holly. Mrs. Cara Holly. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Ms. Kanjin. Ms. Kanjin. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith. Peter Grove. Peterborough Quarther. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Quarther. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Cusetta. Mr. Cusetta. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapath. Canapath. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Babikia. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabat. Mr. Sabat. All those opposed to Mr. Clark's motion will please rise one at a time. And Mr. Be Mr. Mr. Bisson. Madam Jellin. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh Brampton Centre. Mr. Brampton Centre. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Linda. Ms. Linda. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East. Stony Creek. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrews. Ms. Andrews. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Mr. Graykosevich. Mr. Graykosevich. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 66, the nays are 40. The ayes being 66 and the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Rickford has moved third reading of Bill 87, an act to amend various statutes related to energy. It's the pleasure of the House that the motion carry. Aye. Heard some noes. All those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, will please say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Oh my God. I didn't think so. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. Mr. Rickford has moved third reading of Bill 87, an act to amend various statutes related to energy. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk.
Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith Van Quinty. Mr. Smith Van Quinty. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethan Falvey. Mr. Bethan Falvey. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Yurin. Mr. Yurin. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Co. Mr. Down. Mr. Down. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalandra. Mr. Kalandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahollis. Mrs. Carahollis. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willadell. Mr. Cho Willadell. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Smith Peterborough Cortha. Mr. Smith Peterborough Cortha. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Canapathy. Mr. Canapathy. Mr. Canapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Baba. Mr. Baba. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanag. Mr. Tanagasa. Mr. Tanagasa. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabal. Mr. Sabal. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Madam Jelen. Madam Jelen. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Bison. Mr. Bison. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Yamanta. Mr. Yamanta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Gret. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gret. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Fred. Mrs. French. Mrs. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton Mr. East Stony Creek. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton Ms. East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Birch. Ms. Birch. Ms. Burns. Ms. Burns. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Monty Monty Farrell. Mr. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Shrine. Mr. Shrine. The ayes are 66, the nays are 40. The ayes being 66 and the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. Bill 20, be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. The Minister of, just like the Minister of Energy, Northern Development Mines has informed me he has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Relieved to make uh, the vote for my own bill, but today I'm joined by two constituency staff, all the way from Kenora and Dryden. Friends, join me in welcoming Lorna Wood from Dryden and Linda uh, Nelson from Kenora. The member for Sarnia Lampton apparently has a point of order. So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have in my hot little hand here uh, the announcement from uh, Buckingham Palace. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, the name of their uh, newly born baby, Archie Harrison, Mountbatten, Windsor. Congratulations to Queen's Park. Thank you very much. This house stands in recess until 3 p.m.